first of all, I want to say thank you to everybody who's shown up tonight, and my special thanks to Todd Palmer, uh, to Ben, and the rest of the architecture um, biennial staff, and of course to the Terra Foundation for American Art for making today's panel a reality. Um, visionary art and architecture depend on visionary support and visionary funders, um, so we're grateful to all of you behind the scenes who've helped to make this event possible, and especially the architecture biennial. Um, I also want to acknowledge and thank the curator of the photography show, uh, Jesus Fasalo, and then of course I'm humbled to be able to share the stage tonight with the uh, three panelists, all of whom are remarkable practitioners in the area of photography um, and architecture. Our three panelists, um, can you hear me? Am I okay? All right. Um, our three panelists represent a diverse range of photographic responses to um, the built environment in terms of technique, style, um, and they range from collage to conceptual practice to documentary work. It's further worth noting that they all come from different backgrounds that aren't strictly photographic. Marshall is an architect who uses collages in his practice. Marianne's an installation artist who uses photographs as part of her work. David is a sociologist who uses photography within his work. Photography is therefore central to all of their practices um, within their different fields. And as we'll see today, this speaks to the depth, breadth, and centrality of photography as a tool for understanding and making arguments about the built environment um, and how we as humans navigate those spaces physically, conceptually, um, and then also socially. I'm gonna begin tonight with some brief introductions of each of the speakers, um, after which they'll present a short slideshow of their work. So I'll go through them one by, uh, I'll introduce Marshall and he'll talk and then we'll go into Marianne um, and David. Um, after that, I'm going to do a few brief historical comments um, that will set the stage for a dialogue among our, our panelists. Um, and then at the end, after we've had a conversation on the stage, we'd like to invite you to join in with your questions, your comments, and participate in the conversation as well. So please hold on to your questions. And when we open that up, I believe Nick is going to run, do you have a, a microphone to go through the audience? Um, so please hold on to your questions, write anything down that you have of interest, okay? So, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce um, our first panelist who will come up, Marshall Brown, who is a licensed architect and urban designer who uses photographic collages to envision urban worlds yet to come. You can visit his website at marshallbrownprojects.com. He is a Graham Foundation grantee and represented the United States in the 2016 Venice Architecture Biennale. Marshall received his master's degree in architecture and urban design from Harvard University where he won the Drucker Fellowship for Urban Design. Brown is an associate professor at the Illinois Institute of Technology's College of Architecture with numerous publications to his credit, and we're very excited that he'll be speaking today about his collages on display at the uh, at Biennial. Thank you very much. All right, good evening, everyone. Happy holidays. Um, it's very exciting and interesting for me this evening to uh, participate in this panel because I haven't thought that much about the relationship of my work to the field or the discourse of photography, um, despite the fact that I use photographs, specifically architectural photographs, as a raw material in my practice. Um, the Exhibition that I put together for uh, this year's biennial, I titled uh, The Architecture of Creative Miscegenation. Um, for the younger members of the audience, the term miscegenation uh, is a bit archaic. It refers usually to um, something's kind of flickering, right? Uh, it refers usually to uh, laws racist laws that prohibited the mixing between people of different ethnicities, either intermarrying or interbreeding. Um, in my own work, I use this term, creative miscegenation, to refer to the interbreeding of existing forms from diverse origins to create new architecture. So as you can see um, in the display, there are two different scales of work, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the differences between them. So the two larger uh, collages um, come from what I would call visionary projects that explore architecture as a manifestation of power, but also as a construction of the future. Um, these 
projects are located in specific sites. So the one you're seeing here, uh, this image is titled Holy City Number One. Um, it's from a, a series of projects that I designed for Chicago's Circle Interchange, which you see on the left, now known as the Jane Byrne Interchange. Poor Jane Byrne, they kind of added insult to injury. Um, but often known to most as a circle interchange. And the project basically asks, what if after Oprah's passing at age 120, Chicago's center, the center of Chicago becomes a holy city? And um, this is an image of what it might look like. The site is important, of course, because it was where Daniel Burnham proposed the Civic Center and his plan of Chicago um, instead of uh, that monument to democracy we now have a hole in the heart of the city. The second collage is from a much earlier project, an alternative proposal that I developed for the Atlantic Yards rail site, rail yard, Atlantic Yards in Brooklyn. And um, some of you may know it as the site of uh, the Nets basketball arena. And um, this image is called the Vanderbilt Tower. It marries uh, fragments of works by both Mies van der Rohe and Le Corbusier, two estranged fathers of modern architecture, which normally, who normally in our discourse do not meet, or rarely. This is a photograph of my studio floor from a few years ago on the left, and here is the construction of one of these collages in process. Um, they are mostly hand cut and pasted. Um, I do not think there is such a thing as digital collage, and that's important for me to say uh, in this context. I think it's somewhat of a misnomer or some kind of cultural lag. I don't say that with any kind of judgment. I just think that what we sometimes inappropriately call digital collage um, is something else. The scale also matters. These large tableau are also designed to be immersive and viewable potentially by a collective audience. So the smaller ones uh, are from a larger series that I call Chimera. Um, they're really an exploration of the technique on its own. So outside of any site or any narrative or any program or anything else. It's a kind of self-imposed exercise in isolating and testing these techniques that I have been developing the larger collages for some years. Um, again, they're hand cut and pasted. For me, it was about the production of a kind of instant architecture. So they're rapidly made, they're individuated, and serial acts of world making. So there's careful attention to the construction and concealment of the seams. And again, no site, no program, no narrative. You could think of them like sketches. And in some cases, even sketches for projects yet to come. So this is an example of uh, where I chose a single collage from that Chimera series. Um, the sources came from the architects Peter Eisenman, Frank Gehry, and Zaha Hadid. And I translated that into a garden folly for the Arts Club of Chicago, um, which was installed temporarily about a year and a half ago. And here you can also see how that work at that smaller scale has come back out into, let's say, um, larger, more complex projects. So on the left, one of the early kind of sketches for my uh, proposal for the 2016 Venice Biennale, which is a project in Detroit. Um, the small collages function as sketches and provocations. They ground the project in a particular architectural legacy. So in this case, I'm working with uh, projects from Le Corbusier, the Brazilian architect Lina Bobardi, and also the Spanish architects Enrique Marias and Carme Pinos. Um, this is an image of an interior housing unit within the project. Um, it's kind of a cubist construction. And you can start to see how the collage allows me to portray multiple scales of architecture in the city. Um, it allows me to, let's say, represent disjunctions in time. Um, 
And so you can start to read simultaneously the interior of the housing unit with views back to the city. And finally, this is actually the first sketch um, from the 2016 Biennale. And uh, here you can see, of course, probably many of you recognize on the right, Bertrand Goldberg's uh, Marina City. On the left, Le Corbusier's Unité de Habitation. And uh, in between there, kind of hiding in the back, again, Lena Bobardi's uh, SCSC Pompeia. The, the collage is titled Cities Within Cities. And so it was about kind of connecting, the project that I proposed was a city within the city of Detroit, and I was connecting from the very beginning to this, to this legacy. Um, I thought given that we're um, kind of launching this project about Chicago with the Terra Foundation, this seemed an appropriate one to finish with. But back um, to this idea of uh, creative miscegenation. Again, um, this is a theorem, and, and I think that, the, that I've been working with for some time, and so the work that you see downstairs is a kind of demonstration of that theorem. And the theorem basically makes two assertions. Number one, uh, or firstly, about legibility, that I don't think you can fully understand a work of architecture outside the larger field of which it is part. And then the second assertion is about promiscuity, that the work is not constrained by its precedence, but it does create a new set of possible relations between them and itself. That is a menage a trois. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marshall. We're gonna have plenty to talk about during the conversation afterwards. Um, right now, I'd like to introduce um, Marianne. Marianne Mueller is a Zurich-based artist who works with photography, video, installation, and books. She collects observations of quotidian built environments and recontextualizes them in her works, often in reaction to the specific site of an exhibition. You can visit her website at mariannemuller.com for more details. Um, she's a professor at the Zurich University of the Arts with numerous publications to her credit, including a book about the architectural practice of Johnston Marclee, and we're very excited that she could join us today to speak about her work's relationship to architecture. Um, this is the work in uh, Gerhold, just over there. And as I'm not really related to architecture. Um, I started to think about the places I do exhibitions, um, which are normally places um, that are not white cube, um, contemporary art museums places. And um, I don't really know how it came, but I'm much more inspired by these places that have a history or a narrative because it sort of like makes me think, what is it I'm looking at and where are we and um, what used this place to be used for before? And in that case, um, being invited um, to sort of like portray the cultural center um, made me quite happy. I came here, I looked it up in internet of course and I thought like, okay, this doesn't look like Chicago so much. It, could be, maybe I should go to Venice or to Rome. And um, I um, came here to photograph two days and then I traveled south to visit um, the curator um, in Houston for the first time and we had no clue where the exhibition would take place. So for me it was difficult to um, not knowing where the show will be taking place and um, um, actually, um, this is one of my favorite writers, and she had this um, ultra short story, um, her geography, Illinois, and then it starts, um, she knows she's in Chicago, but she does not yet realize that she is in Illinois. And actually, I didn't know that Chicago is in Illinois, <laughs> coming over from Europe. Um, so, she, whatever, she traveled with me and, and gave the title to my work, this was the state of work when I went down to um, see um, Jesus Vazala and we were sort of like laying out images that 
that had um, something in common or were taken in the same place and um, we were thinking of the exhibition hall at that moment and then he said oh no by today it's not the exhibition hall it might be somewhere downstairs in the in the gangways and I was like desperate like I said I, I don't know why should I hang some pictures there these are not really good photographs these are sort of like snapshots and it's it's part of my daily routine and um, um, but it was super interesting to work with um, an architectural historian and theorician and, and, and the way we, we laid out sort of like things that have maybe a filmic moment or a way like these, fa these fake columns you would walk around in the room and, and say, oh, is this a column or is it um, plaster or what does it mean? And then the concept of horizontal city came up and um, we were like, okay, we need the vitrines. This is the perfect um, display case. Um, that we could have because it's like a frame, it's, um, it's sort of like a place in a building and um, it, it matters to me that this used to be uh, used as the Gare Hall um, to commemorate all the, the, the civic wars and, and that maybe objects have been on display here that sort of like talk about the building and the history. So this is an early old stage of the, I see all my titles are not displaying now. But there are subtitles where you could get all the information in case I stop speaking. Um, so it, it reminded me of, um, of Boromini's uh, church, like this, this, in this kind of like different type of curvings, like the altars. And um, I, this is the Venice Dome and this is um, Cultural Center Chicago. Um, so thinking about the place and the story, this is the oldest library in, in Europe, I think, in St. Gallen in Switzerland, the country I come from. Um, so many of these things are related to Baroque architecture. And um, so I'm doing this sort of like research and try to figure out where did the objects go and, and what could be brought in this place uh, instead of. And, and I thought to have these fragmented elements from the building displayed in this cases and sort of like make the, vi the visitor um, review sort of like it's, it's a, like an homage to the building in the building like the building sort of like tells talks about its own history but I've also been looking up like what, what other artists and architects did in historical building like the Palazzo Pitti um, with um, um, Caruso St. John's who did these structures for I think seven or eight images by um, what's the name? <laughs> Thomas Demand, thank you. Um, a house is a house is a house is a house is um, what you mentioned before, um, Greg, is um, a work I did with architects uh, in Los Angeles um, with Johnson Mark Lee. I started visiting them in uh, 2004. They invited me for collaborations and I was like, I'm working with photography. I don't really know how I could collaborate with you on architectural pro uh, projects. And um, so I started visiting like the Eames um, studios, the, this is the gallery, I was um, having a show at the same time. Um, this is sort of like architecture by Johnston Markley mingled with um, references um, with buildings they love in Los Angeles that are not like key tourist um, or architectural like um, highlights. So. So I'm always working with um, kind of like an amount of photogra photographs that I combine and, and I try to sort of like, it's not seamless, but to have these sort of like, um, I'm not working with single images. So I'm, I'm trying to build up an atmosphere or a structure or a narrative through, through um, the combination of images. So this is became the, like the pre like an enlarged sort of like um, beginning of the book and, um, and the end of the book. And I'd like to go back to other projects I did um, recently. This one was in uh, Yekaterinburg. It was an um, biennial as well in um, Iset Hotel, which used to be um, um, a housing complex for KGB um, students. And um, later it was a hotel that was, um, it's been empty now for about five years. And I 
I um, collected all the mirrors from within the building because I had the idea that um, all these KGB uh, young people had been shaving themselves in those mirrors and, and if, if I sort of like accumulate them, I have like a, a, a massive kind of self-portrait by people growing up um, uh, in a very uh, special profession and I was also sort of like interested in the last um, Russian Tsar being brought to Yekaterinburg to be murdered. So, so it's a kind of, a, it's called Hall of, Hall of Mirrors. It's only like eight square meters big. Um, and it's made from um, all the, the mirrors I found in, with people working there or in the building itself. Um, so some objects is um, a work I did for um, this type of architecture that could be called like stall architecture or art fair architecture, which is um, an architecture to, I have to go back one, uh, which is sort of like very um, shitty. <laughs> <laughs> and I brought in, for instance, these doors. So they have, um, you can have all the doors and, and um, kind of like um, square meters, um, and, and then normally it gets painted. And I got interested in, in the, kind of the, the verity of um, this, this um, element um, situation to display art. And then I combined it with um, photographs from my archive, like uh, staircases and, and um, these type of triptychs that show up in the book, um, uh, stairs, etc. that I'll show later on. Facing West is an exhibition I installed after departing from here in October. And it's the same type of um, stall architecture, but in a kind of kunst hall, like in, an, um, in a type of gallery. And they built in these walls um, to fill the space, but also to clean up the space. And I added a curtain that is doing some sort of the same thing, but um, I made a lobby for the curtain. So when you enter the gallery now, you enter like in a, in a room before you enter the, the, the exhibition room. And the curtain is... Um, is having uh, photochromic pigments. Um, it's silk screen printed and it reacts to daylight, to sunlight, and it turns blue where the, the sun hits the curtain and it's moving very, very slowly. So there's it's the only thing displayed in the show. This is what happens when the sun hits it and it's hard to document. So the more I work with space, the more I learned photography is not the right tool to document my work anymore. Mm. This was downstairs, so like the opposite atmosphere of um, a very loud, noisy, rising sun. Um, positioned in the east of the gallery and, um, the, cur and the windows we opened uh, are positioned in the west of the gallery. Stairs, etc. at Upstate is an uh, artist-run space in Zurich um, by students of mine and it's an old it's an occupied building and it's an old garage and I was intrigued by the existing facilities like um, inbuilt architecture, um, <coughs> like there's a toilet and this lavabo and I added um, a video of an object I made and um, this was um, the book lounge and we had music and the sound of the, the video came from these loudspeakers and I just want to play you short if I manage to do that. We, I'm working with um, um, someone who is kind of like uh, making this um, additional sound like in professional movies where you would synchronize everything that is on the found footage but make it more precise. And um, I'm interested in how the sound um, alterates the, the presence of photography. This was Tokyo um, in Japan, vacant a project space where they have a bookstore downstairs and upstairs and they rent out for fashion shows and um, other activities and I, I love the, the quality of the space. Um, it's like an uninsulated project space and you have no idea what's going on in this space. It could be like a place for uh, very young people to have parties. And I was thinking about um, the, the kind of like um, a lot of like spatial, spatial Japanese um, aspects of, um, 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 sorry, I think I'm slowing down. This, for instance, is a video from an art, art in um, 
architecture project in Zurich that is sort of like mimicking this Japanese quality of, um, of water basins and I introduced it to Japan and, and um, These are all objects found in the places. And um, then this one, for instance, is a museum in uh, Zurich that used to be um, uh, part of the National Museum. It's a building that has been moved 65 meters when they built a new building in the 70s and they didn't want to destroy it. So they moved it and it became part of the National Museum where they had um, shows, permanent exhibitions about um, the um, kind of like the living and um, the culture of, um, um, of housing in the 18th, 19th century. So I was, um, with all these ovens, every room has, an, has one of these historical, it's an absurd house now, it has historical inbuilt um, elements and I was photographing fragments and, and reorganizing things and taking everything that's there as granted as part of my show, like also the, this crazy ceiling, uh, like, like a bit similar to what we have here. And Stairs Etc. is um, a book with, um, I think, 1,500 photographs from my archive that I, that I um, try to organize within uh, chapters that kind of make um, a lot of sense because I had to think about what is a fence and what is a balustrade and what is a handrail and okay, handrails are not part of the business because I don't have enough. So it's a bit uh, referring to, to the, um, this idea in photography that you would work um, in, um, in, in series, which is very common. And um, I did these series, but not per purpose, um, but, but from like what I found in my archive and um, there will be two more books coming up, one about nature and one about like body and, and um, moving things. So there's a narrative through topics uh, like the object would shrink or grow or... Um, and it's, um, I think, um, designers and architects like it as an inspiration source. Photographers say this is not photography. So either my photographs are like these kind of four by six inch Walmart prints or they're like large scale physical objects that, that um, talk to you. And in the book I didn't make any decisions about format. It's the format the print has in my archive and I just tried to have no aesthetical decisions. Also no Photoshop or it's a cheap scans and um, we had to print it in a way that it looks good. So if you see this, what I did with the vitrines is kind of like an easy step. It's only about scale. This is the direction the images have in the book, but it's too hard to look at them this way. That's why I turned them from you. And then if I'd be an architect, this is um, my architecture. It's a box. And it's my first uh, sort of like solution to show photography. I started doing these boxes in 95. It's um, like these prints from Walmart between two glass plates. You can turn them around. Um, the viewer is also like the, the curator. You can put them back in a box, you can hang them on a wall, and you can change the, nar change the narrative. And um, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you.
think I have that covered up. Thank you very much, Marianne. Um, I'm taking notes on some various conversations that we can have when we get uh, done with everybody's presentations. Uh, but before we do that, um, David Shalyal will come up and speak. Um, David is a sociologist and photographer who's interested in issues of social stratification and meaning in the social and physical worlds. His photographs have been included in numerous exhibitions and he also makes documentary films and websites, having served as an editor for the influential Gapers Block here in Chicago, where he worked to increase journalistic coverage of underserved communities. His personal website is davidshalyall.com and David earned his PhD from the University of Chicago and is an assistant professor of sociology at St. Olaf College. We're excited to have him here with us today to talk about his photographs of the built environment as a lived social experience. So please welcome David. So, um, yeah, so my name is David Chaliel, and today I want to talk a little bit about um, my project that's here in the Biennial, but I want to give it some uh, additional kind of context. Um, and so as a sociologist and a photographer, I'm, I'm really interested in the way that um, the sort of the built environment and the social environment is, uh, those inter environments are intertwined, um, and I hope that comes through in some of this work. Um, and so as I work in these projects, I work on projects um, uh, around the world that are sort of investigating this, this kind of community connection of place. And often that has to do with uh, a kind of conflict uh, about place. Um, and as people try to um, sort of assert themselves or assert themselves collectively um, in a particular environment, here this is an example of work in Belfast, Northern Ireland, uh, and conflict around uh, the loyalist and unionist um, design uh, for place. Um, but also thinking about uh, places that it's not this sort of, um, I think the story that we've sort of heard uh, in this sort of very straightforward way of this, there are these two groups and they um, are really in conflict and they're really trying to say whose place is this, but also how do you conceptualize uh, sort of different modes of power as they operate in an environment. In this case, this is work, uh, recent work from uh, France and in the north of France in an area that is literally trying to figure out how to um, remake itself uh, in the shadow of its former uh, industrial past, in this case both thinking about infrastructure and uh, the remains of uh, coal mining. Um, and then also thinking about places, and this will be the last of the sort of three projects I mentioned here before we move in, but also thinking in, um, again, a very different kind of place, the way that different kinds of communities or different kinds of uses are prioritized, in this case in a sort of a spectacular way in Dubai where even mansions are being demolished to make way for this sort of new vision of what the city is. And in, so in this way I think about my work um, and the biennial um, about the plan for transformation um, as sort of falling in this context of uh, conflict. Uh, uh, sort of an organization of place, uh, meaning, um, and how we, uh, how we connect uh, to place. And so um, this work, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Plan for Transformation, this is this massive project the city of Chicago um, launched, the Chicago Housing Authority launched, uh, to demolish many of its uh, modernist buildings. Um, in the process, it went through um, uh, the sort of tremendous amount of dispersal where people um, ended up primarily on the south and the west sides of the city um, and in totally new kind of communities. Um, while at the same time, there have been these very slow developing mixed income communities that have been placed where these public housing uh, developments, these large scale developments once were. Um, and that's the sort of context for this broader project is this big shift that's happening in the city of Chicago. And, but the project itself is much bigger than what we see on the, on the walls of the gallery downstairs, and it includes everything from sort of work um, with, uh, with film production and uh, work with even just family pictures made for residents who lived, in this case, in Cabrini Green. Um, also thinking about things like how do we memorialize place. Uh, the photograph on the left uh, is a photograph of the Stamps uh, Brigade um, having this sort of um, giant sort of send off for the last white building as it's being demolished uh, in Cabrini Green. Uh, and on the right, uh, new construction on the site of uh, the Stateway Gardens developments, now uh, Park Boulevard. And so in that context, there's also the creation of these new communities. And so there's both literally new home, um, but also a sort of new community, new focal points. And this is, I think, a really important thing to conceptualize as we think about uh, what the future is of our communities. Um, but at the same time, and, and I think this is something to emphasize, uh, that in, in many ways, it's also about promises that are left uh, unfulfilled. And so as we spend, uh, you know, if you spend time in the city of Chicago, uh, particularly as you head down State Street, you see uh, many of these open fields where public housing once stood uh, um, that sort of promised as redevelopment, but it still sits uh, empty uh, to this day. 
So I've been working on this work for over 15 years. Um, it's one of the first projects, in fact, I think really the first project I started when I moved here uh, back in 2002. Um, and you know, I was just sort of uh, amazed that people weren't talking about it. I mean, it's not to say that people weren't talking about the plan for transformation, but it wasn't this sort of this thing that was consuming the city. And it seemed to me this thing that was really, it should be. Um, I think this photograph is remarkable um, in the way that we can not only see sort of the last of the sort of mid-rise buildings, um, but be, uh, beneath it, we see Brooks Homes uh, in its, uh, both in its sort of a pre, sort of like derelict or derelict state, uh, just beyond it with the triangles, uh, the redeveloped space beyond that, Roosevelt Square, which is mixed income, income community, and of course we have UIC and the Loop and, uh, and, and so on. And so this opportunity to sort of see the city and try to conceptualize the city. And so I think about this project as not just being about a sort of a documentary project, but also one that's really evoking, um, in this case, memory, uh, place, present, uh, and, and sort of in future. And so a lot of the project is really about this notion of uh, dereliction and really trying to ruminate on this um, this intentional dereliction, this intentional movement away from uh, a style, uh, a, a style of social organization, uh, and beyond that, even to the sort of the outright demolition of this a particular um, form of social and physical organization that we really dwell on what it means uh, to sort of abandon this idea, to abandon this kind of project, and to move towards something different. So I hope that the work is really emphasizing this element that as we you know look at these you know photograph after photograph of um, dereliction and decline that there's this emphasis on um, sort of the potential, the promise, uh, and of course the disaster, um, and and I think that. It's also important to think about how people relate to these images and what does it mean to look at affordable housing? What does it mean to look at the dereliction or the demolition of affordable housing? And what does it mean, uh, depending on who we are, who I am with my camera, who these people are um, watching from here, um, and residents, of course, as they're um, attempting to understand the sort of these cataclysmic changes. Um, so we see this movement away from, in this case, Iggy's, Iggy's homes looking towards Hilliard homes, which remains. Um, but again, this idea of um, there's this uh, uh, elimination of one particular approach. And it's a particular approach that was done at great, great expense. Um, so you know, uh, the um, Plan for Transformation was funded primarily with HOPE $6. It's is a massive federal campaign to transform public housing in the country, both in terms of demolition and reconstruction. It's we're talking you know, billions of dollars, um, a billion dollars spent in Chicago alone uh, and so to think about the way that you know state city federal and of course private money also play a role in this and shaping how uh, what our possibilities are for work what our possibilities might be for home in this case these guys on the left are um, you know scrapping um, housing uh, material that's left over from Robert Taylor homes and as we think about places like uh, here this the former site of Ida B Wells homes and as people are you know, practicing football, um, that we don't forget sort of what was, uh, but also we don't forget about the sort of debate around uh, what was and what is. Um, as we think about people moving into Park Boulevard, again, used to be Stateway Gardens, or think about these developments that are at the site of uh, Cabrini Green, that we also don't forget that these sort of monoliths, these modernist monoliths that stood, you know, stood over the city, um, that as, as, as troubled as they became in the end, that they were sort of a reminder of uh, a kind of promise made about affordable housing in the city of Chicago. And I think also a reminder of, you know, again, that promise that wasn't followed through on. Uh, and so as we sort of move away from having these sort of physical reminders um, of this kind of social commitment, how can we think about um, continuing to sort of ruminate on what those changes might be? And of course, my hope is that it's not simply about the CHA, and it's not simply about the plan for transformation, but also about uh, other sorts of conflicts, not just, you know, in, in our city, perhaps. And so in this case here, thinking about a project I've been working on for just about six years now about the demolition of a, a large pocket of, of Englewood um, for an intermodal freight yard. And so this is part of a, a long-term filmmaking project. Or thinking about cities, in this case, particularly Midwestern cities, as they wrestle with what does it mean uh, to have this industrial heritage and to have this industrial present, uh, to go to places you know, seemingly uh, in, a, in another kind of world uh, where there's, again, this competition for which kind of community, for whom, uh, why. Um, and again, here, just going back to the sort of um, initial French case, that sort of uh, as these coal mines uh, 
collapsed, um, I suppose both literally and, and physically, or and in, 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 um, conceptually, that you know what was left uh, were these slag heaps, um, and to think about what it might mean uh, to sort of rework or to reimagine what we have uh, and what we can do, and my hope is that the opportunity at the biennial is to focus those conversations about the past, um, about the present, about the future, and to be able to focus them now so that we can have that conversation together. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, David. I really appreciate all that. Um, uh, at the risk of adding too much more to the conversation that we're going to be having, I'm going to present some, now some notes on the relationship between photography and architecture. Uh, these are not at all intended to be comprehensive, and I've been taking a lot of notes myself about how some of these ideas might weave between the other presenters' conversations. But my hope is to offer some historical background to issues addressed by my colleagues here. Um, first, I want to describe uh, a little bit about photography's invention um, and the fact that it was invented and developed in the early 19th century parallel to a new phase in the urbanization of the world um, and therefore in the expansion of the built environment. So there's a distinct relationship between the development of photography as a medium of representation and this rapid growth um, and expansion of the built environment. As an example, I uh, introduced Victor Prevost, a Frenchman who made a commercial studio um, in New York City in the early 1850s and who was so struck by the newness of New York City that he began methodically photographing buildings and streets with the intent of producing a comprehensive photographic study of the city. His work foreshadowed subsequent projects like Berenice Abbott's Changing New York, taken during the 1930s, another period of rapid growth. Likewise, Edward Moybridge documented the city of San Francisco in 1878 using a series of 13 glass plates, which you can see on the top there, and then I've got a close-up of some of them, to produce a 360 degree panorama to capture the scale of a city that had grown in less than 30 years from 1,000 to 200,000 inhabitants. In each of these examples, photography functioned as a tool for making sense of unprecedented architectural change. And that's part of where I think the theme lies as it sort of connects some of the other uh, presenters' work here. Um, as the historian Peter Bacon Hales wrote, these photographers took the sprawling ooze of the city and placed it diminished in scale and now orderly within the frame of a photograph. So photography therefore offered evidence of a new architectural order, which could be shared easily in the form of photographic reproductions, um, as it did through architectural journals, the same early versions of the architectural journals that Marshall uses as sort of the collage elements of his work. But it also provided a sense of power and control, thereby shaping viewers' experience of the built environment by elevating them to the level of what philosopher Michel de Certeau has called the solar eye of omniscience, and removing viewers high above the, urban, the, the fray of the urban fabric. This perspective, of course, failed to account for the people that inhabit the built environment, with the consequence that this style of architectural photography came to be associated with massive urban renewal projects that divided neighborhoods and segregated cities in the middle of the 20th century. And I'm just briefly sort of emblematic of that as the work of Robert Moses and some of his use of photography during that time period. On the other hand, as film speeds increased and flash bulbs came into more widespread use, a different kind of image of architectural space began to emerge one that was populated and whose social structure became an object of fascination for nascent sociologists who felt the need to expose what they perceived to be the unsafe conditions of city life, especially among the lower classes. And here I'm showing images from Jacob Rees's How the Other Half Lives, for which he famously used magnesium powder flash to shed light on the conditions of tenement housing, oftentimes with some very questionable assumptions about the self-inflicted causes for these slum conditions. He's not a very good example of sociology. Um, by the post-World War II era, however, photographers like Reuter Carava in Harlem made documentary images that were far more sensitive to the complexities of urban life precisely because they lived or worked closely within these communities, rather than literally busting down the door to take a photograph, as Reese is alleged to have done. By the 1960s, these kinds of intimate photographs of city life even found their way into urban planning documents, like the 1969 Plan for New York City, which was a six-volume master plan for the city that contained thousands of photographs 
and which reflected a massive shift among urban planners from the solar eye perspective I described just a moment ago to a more street level perspective that was shaped by Jane Jacobs's influential The Death and Life of Great American Cities, published in 1961. These types of images provided important evidence for the lived social experience of architecture in an urban space. Um, in which uh, families turned front stoops into summertime living rooms and children turned fire escapes into playgrounds. Thirdly, photography has allowed for a visual discourse between architectural reality and architectural fiction since every photograph is simultaneously connected to the thing that was before the lens of the camera while also being a representation of it that is separate from reality. And here I'm thinking of Mies van der Rohe's visionary montages for his unrealized Friedrich Strauss skyscraper from 1921, in which he drew stark visual contrasts between the blurred motion of the street, the stately and comfortably bourgeois buildings of modern commercial life, and the hand-drawn, knife-like prow and stunningly flat surface of the proposed glass skyscraper, dramatically emphasizing the co-presence of two distinct temporalities um, and modalities of architectural representation, modernity and tradition, represented in the same image here. Mises' later collages even more fully embraced the potential of photography by mixing a variety of taken and found photographs, as in this uh, interior perspective of the Convention Hall here in Chicago from 1954. And in both cases, the point that I want to emphasize is that there's no attempt at hiding the montage, um, which remains distinguishable via contrast of texture, media, or color, thus hinting at this sort of openness to the existence, the coexistence of the real and the imaginary in the image. Now, of course, this effect is hyperextended within photographic collages, like the ones I'm showing you now, but it's present in all photographs because while they point to reality, they also present it to us in a fundamentally unreal state, as frozen, as two-dimensional, and as seen from a fixed vantage point. So it's always important to understand that no matter how real a photograph seems, it is obviously divorced from reality itself. The three photographers um, who will be joining me on stage in just a minute today all engage with these strategies and traditions, making new histories and causing us to see our present architectural spaces in light of a rich, if occasionally conflicted, architectural past. As a way of starting the conversation, I'd like to suggest a few of the ways in which they engage in a dialogue with the history of architectural representation. So, for example, building on my last point, Marshall Berman's collages seem to be in dialogue with Mises' use of collage, as we obviously know from the title of the building, uh, his Vanderbilt collage and the fact that he already described that it's about Mies and Larry Courbusier. But I want to also emphasize um, his emphasis on surfaces, on the visibility of the cut, and his projection of a new vision into an existing built environment. And then, because I'm a little obsessed with another collage artist, Romare Bearden, I also want to point out the flip side of collage as representation, which is the idea of collage as a built thing itself, and something that I was really drawn to looking at the photographs in Marshall's studio of all the various collage pieces and how your compositions are put together in your argument, too, that you are very much not a digital collagist, that what you do is that you are collaging actual fabricated uh, pieces from the existing um, photographic realm. Um, for example, in Bearden's The Block from 1971, the artist represents a particular block in Harlem, but he also quite literally builds an architectural model of sorts by layering his cut and paste images of textured surfaces as if they were actual post and lintel constructions. And that's what I'm showing here in this close up, the little blowout on the bottom side here. So when we get to the discussion, I hope that we can address the meaning of process and technique with Marshall, um, which I know is central to his, process, to his own practice but also the idea of how um, inhabitants modify their environments with David, um, because one of the things that um, Romare Bearden addressed in here is the way that inhabitants reshaped their in urban environment, took over front stoops as public living rooms, that he actually graffitied into his collaged canvas as a way of um, serving as a sort of mimetic reference to the um, actual collaging on, or the sort of uh, graffitiing on of the urban landscape um, by the residents in Harlem. Marianne's work um, causes us to look with fresh eyes at the quotidian built environment. Um, and here, I, especially thinking of the dialogue that her work is in with Ed Ruscha's work of the 1960s, with which her book, A House is a House is a House, is a house, do I have it right? A house is a house is a house is a house is a house, um, uh, is in dialogue and seems to be in direct um, discourse with. Um, that includes uh, the use of the references to, of course, snapshot photography um, 
and the fact the way that her work and Rouchet's work use the snapshot to subvert conventional photographic modes of framing architecture um, to instead reproduce an experience of architecture, one that is fleeting and incomplete. So I'm hoping that we can have a little discussion about that too. I also hope that we can explore uh, Marianne and Rouchet's shared interest in the embodied experience of the beholder before their works, um, which is a distinct commentary on the relationship between photographs of buildings and the buildings themselves. And here I'm thinking of the ar many arguments that have made, been made about how Rouché is in fact riffing off of panoramic photos from the 19th century in creating this enormous image of the Sunset Strip in his book, Every Building on the Sunset Strip from 1966, which if you're not familiar with is an accordion book that shows both sides of the street and that you have to hand hold and stretch out as a viewer. He plays off of that idea that in the panorama I showed earlier, that you're supposed to be able to have a completely omniscient view of the landscape and see all, everything at once. And yet, at the same time that he makes, transforms this over a mile of the Sunset Strip into something that you seem to be able to control and manage, you're absolutely frustrated by your inability to ever really see the whole thing at once. It was Rouchet's own inside joke on this whole idea that every building of the Sunset Strip, yes, you can own it, you can hold it, but you can't really possess it visually um, effectively. Um, and if Rouchet cleverly plays with scale, I'm struck by how Marianne's she knows she's in Chicago, cleverly plays with the tension between reality and its representation. Um, and I was drawn to this even when I went uh, in just before this, that uh, there's the fact that every time I go into the galleries to experience her piece, I'm oftentimes the only one who initially notices the photographs. They're almost so cleverly camouflaged by being photographs of the cultural center situated within that very space that many viewers fail to notice them, yet once they do, that quick glance suddenly causes them to sort of experience a state of vertigo almost, um, where the representation jumps out of the display case. The scale is suddenly the enormous. In this case, going back to that issue of scale earlier, you rarely see photographs of the thing that are bigger than the thing that was photographed. Photographs typically shrink and order things. Here she's expanded and exploded the size of the building in order to get us to pay closer attention to the building. So I'd really like to talk more about the installation, the use of the vitrines to simultaneously reveal and camouflage the photographs, and the way the installation functions as a meta-commentary on architecture and photography, and on the relationship between photographs as objects and architecture as a representation. Um, all of this leads me to my conclusion and to David's work, um, about which we could also have a discussion regarding the installation, since his photographs are hung within the installation Five Rooms by Paul Anderson and Paul Preisner. Um, uh, David and I have spoken briefly about the fact that those glazed tiles or bricks in the, in the five rooms installation are very reminiscent of the kind of institutional architecture he photographs. Um, of course, I'd also like to speak about David's work and how it fits within a long tradition of documentary photography that aims not only to analyze our built environment through comparative typologies, and here I'm thinking of the Becker's work and his relationship to his earlier piece. Um, this is his isolated buildings from 2006 to the present on the right but also um, how David's work uh, uh, functions as a protracted examination of human living conditions within challenging social or economic conditions. And here I'm thinking of the work of Latoya Ruby Frazier, who attempts to give voice to the residents of Braddock, Pennsylvania, and who's argued that the demolition of housing and factories, which you see on the right of her side there, um, actually coincides with and is a contributor to the mental and physical well-being of communities and individuals and the decline of that. Um, that there's a, there's a distinct relationship between built space and the human life uh, of the inhabitants of that space. A major component of both Fraser's identity as well as David's, it seems like, too, is functioning in the role of, of advocate through photography, and so I think that's an interesting conversation starter. Um, so on that note, um, uh, we're at time, and I'd like to take a, uh, a little breather. We can bring the lights up a little bit. And I'd like to turn the conversation over to the larger group of the panelists to come up on the stage here and share it with me. And Marshall, perhaps we could begin with some of your thoughts about process and technique since you addressed that also in your presentation. So I guess the question was about how uh, you use, how you specifically create meaning, not just through the subject matter of your pieces, but through the process and technique that you're using this type of collage and your very specific reference that digital collage is not what you do. Yeah, I'm not so sure. I mean, meaning is a tricky one for architecture because 
architecture has a lot of meaning conferred onto it after architects leave the stage. But that being said, um, for me, I mean, I'm a little bit old fashioned uh, when it comes to the question of technique in the sense that I still believe that um, technique matters in terms of, uh, you know, the kind of content or artifacts um, or spaces or forms that are generated in the end. Um, for me, you don't really get one without the other. So I think, at least in our field or maybe in the world today, there's this kind of, um, there's I think a general, let's say, irreverence for media or a kind of looseness about it. Hence the notion that you could say, oh, this thing I made with Photoshop is a collage and this thing I made with knives and glue is a collage and it doesn't matter we call them the same thing. Um, I actually don't agree with that kind of uh, attitude or position because you get up, because you know, we can go into the gallery and you look at them, you get up close to them and they are not the same thing, right? They're not the same thing. And um, it's not that one is better or worse, but they are different and I think, so for me it's important to uh, maintain a high degree of articulation about those differences as, let's say, a matter of craft, but also a matter of concept. As a little follow-up to that, you use the word creative miscegenation to describe it, and I'm wondering if there's a way in which the use of actual physical collage is part of that creative miscegenation where you wouldn't have the same experience of miscegenation in digital compositions, if that's part of where your emphasis comes on that. Sure, I mean, vision is not only optic, it's also haptic, right? And so the things that, you know, the kind of physical interactions we have, um, with materials, I think, still carry a lot of importance. There's also just the question of error, or mistakes. A lot of my interest in collage has to do with the productivity of error. So the way in which collage takes me out of my own intentions. I've tried it multiple ways, and what I've found is that continuing to work with knives, paper, and glue um, keeps me closer to that space where the collage um, uh, pushes me off of my intentions. And that's one of the main things that I value about it as a, as a medium. I'm really glad that you brought up the idea of, of haptics and the sort of multi-sensory and tactile quality of your work, and perhaps that's a good segue to talk, Marianne, about some of the, the embodied experience in front of those pieces of yours, in part between the, the relationship. You're creating a collage of sorts between the marble and the actual marble that's in there, and then the photographs of the marble, and then the space around it. And maybe if you could talk a little bit about that sort of embodied experience in front of your pieces in the vitrines, and how you came about, you know, some of those decisions and, and intentions. Um, there were not so many decisions I had to take because um, the scale was given. And um, also, even the proportion of my photographs, which are usually two by three by sort of like bending, how would you say, folding the upper part of the photograph to, to form this sort of like ceiling within the case. Um, I didn't have to crop the image um, mainly, so it's sort of like it, it was fitting um, into the case when you fold the top of the image. And I, I like the idea that by f how, how would you bending, how would you say, yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's the backdrop, but it's also the, um, the top part of the vitrine that is um, one single photograph. And this helps um, create this kind of like illusion of a three-dimensionality because the, the form of the, the shape is like a trapez, how do you say? Mm -hmm. Trapez form. Um, and then you have these, these um, divisions, like you have the frame around, but you have these two divisions um, because it's a three-part uh, vitrine. And from, depending on from which side you walk upon the vitrine, the image gets cut visually in different parts and you feel like, oh, I'm looking at it from the left side and from the right side, but actually the image stays the same because it has this photographical one-eye perspective. 
but the illusion is is quite um, fascinating because you never know why is it going like this and not like that now. Mm -hmm. So actually, I I like um, um, yeah, I'm always in favor if there haven't uh, too many decisions to be taken care upon because. That's how it's possible, that's the easiest way, and, and, and that's how it works. So I really felt like I was just lucky by also the proportions and the, the how they, I mean, we've been choosing the four images in terms of, they had to be vertical, and just for once, I didn't have many vertical photographs. I, I don't know why, I took mostly horizontal photographs in this building, so there wasn't a lot of choice. Usually I have a lot of material, and here I have maybe like six, and then we have been picking the fours that, that matched most. So. so it's about like photography is one thing, but then selecting, editing, thinking what could be done with it mm -hmm. um, is the next step. I was really struck by that too, the way that the vitrines create a, a, an extra photographic experience of your photograph as you're constantly reframing it depending on what part of the vitrine you're seeing it in, which then to me seems like a reflection on how we're constantly experiencing space in a world after photography for how it lines up to the conventions of a picturesque image. And that that's an interesting sort of staging that's happening for the beholder in front of your piece. So. Um, and if you want me to add something about the material or the materialization, mm -hmm. we've been thinking of it should be super matte. And there have been tests and everybody was like, oh, it's matte is the be best because we don't have the reflection from the mirrors. And in the end, through the process of gluing it, it started to be glossy again. But then when I came to see it, I was like, this is not really what we intended to do, but it's much better because it's sort of like has the same type of gloss than the marble has as well. So. So mm -hmm. there are many things you, you kind of like have thoughts about it and you make a decision and then you have this kind of like um, um, something else is happening and, um, and then you accept it and you embrace it and, and, and you come up with better ideas than w when everything is feasible and following your sort of like very smart um, whatever thoughts of how things should be. Yeah. And D David, um, I also I want to. I was really struck for those of you um, who recognize the Hennigan wrecking throughout all of your pictures. Um, I, I was also struck in the, the the sort of end where you were talking about space and place. And if I remember correctly, the the motto for Hennigan wrecking is "We, we make, make space." space. Um, and so I wanted you to talk a little bit about that, about this sort of dialectic between space and place, and then how this wrecking company has that title and that they constantly show up in your images and how that relates to the sense of abandonment and loss of community. Sure, yeah, I mean, I really do have this, you know, moment where looking at the photographs, I think, for the first time all together and thought, like, is this an ad for Hennigan? And, you know, I mean, it just, you or know. Or a counter ad. Yeah, or a counter ad, right. But I mean, just sense of, you know, but I think that's part of that framing of the work is, is, is something that becomes really important in how we, how we observe it and not simply how we sort of move around it, but, you know, what do we bring with it? you know, bring with ourselves to the, to sort of observing the work. But yeah, this notion of this sort of, um, this sort of reaction between sort of space and place. I can remember when I was in graduate school, I was in, uh, at a class with Saskia Sasson, and I, you know, and I, I think I used, I kept using space and space and space and space, and she kept saying, like, what do you mean by space? Like, what's, you, are you talking about geographic space? Are you thinking about geographic place? Is this about, are you emphasizing a connection to something? What is it more? And, you know, and I think just at 25 or whatever that was, this sort of idea of, um, oh yeah, right, this notion of space and place is a really critical, uh, of course, you know, long-standing debate, um, not only within architecture, but of course within sociology, and how do we represent um, what sort of, uh, what is uh, and um, what it can be. Um, and so I think that's something that I, I think a lot about in my work. Um, and I think as we conceptualize the notion of wrecking and the context and this notion of this idea we make space, um, it's, uh, I'm always thinking about space for whom, um, or, or place for whom. Um, and my hope is that by focusing these photographs in this way that's about that act of demolition, about that act of change, that, um, you know, we might um, spend some time thinking about, uh, yeah, yeah, for whom is, is this change? Uh, for whom is this change uh, not? Um, and I think that that's the sort of, uh, that sort of question that hangs over um, any of these attempts at reworking the city. Do any of you have questions for each other? Um, you know, there was a, 
uh, this isn't a question, but it's a kind of reflection on the the last question of David. It's like you were picking up on a uh, kind of element that keeps showing up in the work, probably unintentionally or simply by virtue of the work that you were doing or the the topic in preparation for this. It, it made me remember that in preparation for this uh, panel, and because it's the first time I'm talking about this work in the context of photography, let's say, generally, um, that it, it occurred to me that certain architectural photographers show up a lot in these collages, specifically Hedrick Blessing. It's like all over the place, you know, and now suddenly I see it <laughs> in the same way you see this wrecking crew. And so maybe that becomes an inspiration for another project, I think, at some point soon. If Tara wants to fund it, I'm happy. Yeah. Mm -mm. It's the, right on topic. It, it's interesting that you say that. There's, there's a, I'm, I, I'm trying to remember who the quote is from, but it's, um, I, I can't remember if it was the curator at the Museum of Modern Art for the recent show about collage, and they were talking about one of the effects of the power of the collages that Mies van der Rohe used in his work and sort of developing it and promoting it then led people to almost walking around the urban landscape, seeing Mies van der Rohe buildings as if they were a collage on the landscape and seeing them through the filter of the collage because that's how they had been so um, heavily manifested in the public imagination is as this thing we describe, you know, like plaza architecture or plaza um, sculptures is like a space invader dropped into the plaza. Mies van der Rohe's buildings had that kind of a quality too, like a collage, like existing sort of asynchronously with the rest of the landscape around them for a while at least. Um, so that's a, that's a very interesting apt observation. That's great. Yeah. Um, I suppose um, in a second we should open up to see if there's any questions from the audience, but I also wanted to um, see if anybody had any thoughts about how your photographs as photographs or your practice, as photographic practice to be sure to incorporate everything, um, contribute to the making of a new history or histories about the built environment, uh, that specifically that relationship to the idea of histories that's part of the architecture of Biennial. You're looking at me. Um, I, I can answer this, I don't know. Well, you said maybe you, that you like to work in historically loaded spaces and for your work to engage with those histories. And I was really struck with the amount of research that you did on this particular space. And sort of, it has a, a history quite literally as a place, but that history is written and rewritten. And there are many ways that that history is told to other people. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm curious about your work as yet another layer on all of those writings about the Chicago Cultural Center and about the Grand Army of the Republic Hall. Mm -hmm. um, I can only answer it in a way that places kind of like, um, like Biennales, for instance, when they rehab and people come back and they see maybe in the same venues different works. We know it a lot from, for instance, the Venice um, art biannual where all the countries sort of like have um, a room and every time you go there you see a complete different proposition but you would still remember the older propositions years ago and these layers up to uh, some sort of a collective um, um, energy in a space like the German pavilion where Hans Hake was sort of like um, drilling out the, the floor, for instance. Um, every artist that goes into the German pavilion to represent Germany sort of like has to deal with this memory that is, um, that is in every visitor's sort of like um, 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 memory. And, and I think that's the interesting thing about institutions or buildings that persist because they are there and you go back and revisit them. Like I'm here for the third time this year and every time the building is different to me, but I would every time sort of like remember moments. I, re I remember when the, um, the Gare Hall was empty and there were some people, homeless people from the street sort of like reorganizing their belongings and stretching out their feet and sh taking off their shoes in this, on this huge carpet. So it's sort of like one image I add to 
to the building somehow. So I think architecture can only be perceived through like individuals and through through memories. So I guess when this work is going to be taken down, and I heard it might stay a bit longer than the rest, I'm not sure, but I'm quite flattered. I think it, it's nice to have it lonesome as some sort of like something that remains from from the architecture biannual and then and then it might be standing there by itself and then it might disappear again but but people might remember um, these elements and where have they been taken from or they look at different parts of the building in a different way or well, that's the only thing I can say as an answer and does that answer what you ask me yeah, and David, do you see your work in, in a way as a, as a sort of historian of this moment in, you, you, in Chicago? Yeah, I mean, it's one of the things that's, I mean, I think from the outset, one of the things I said about making the work was that I was surprised that, uh, that there wasn't a lot of work being made about this, you know, this, like, this radical shift uh, in the city and thinking that it was important to make work about it. Um, and I think that, that the sense of um, that, that moment's passing is something that is, is only clearer to me uh, in time. And I think that um, preparing for the exhibition and thinking about you know, what, what work would be um, included in the biennial, then that also led me to sort of think about this idea of, yeah, how do we, or how is history constructed? Um, and how do we uh, legitimate particular narratives of history? Um, and, and how do we even, um, what does it mean then to have this work um, about the city and about uh, a particular moment uh, in the city's history that I think can speak quite uh, well contemporarily, but still, um, how does what does it mean then to have it included included in the biennial at this time? Um, and so, yeah, I think with with each passing year, I also find myself thinking back about how, um, in some ways, the time is is gone. Um, there's, there's something new now, we can learn from it, but how is it that power uh, affects sort of how that story is told? And I think the inclusion of the biennial is one aspect uh, of that power, one aspect of accessing that narrative um, and sort of constructing a uh, history of Chicago. It certainly puts it very front and center in the middle of the city of Chicago and in a, in a historic Chicago moment, um, so. Um, I, at this point, I'm noticing the time, and perhaps if anybody in the audience has uh, any comments or questions that they'd like to add, um, Nick may have a microphone that he could pass over to you um, so that we can hear your questions or comments. Oh, looks like we have one in the back. Um, so it's already been said that you, that all three of you have been collected here and that you don't necessarily self-define as photographers. And I'm just wondering how, um, how have you noticed the difference between the way your work is contextualized, whether or not it's inside of a discussion from your own discipline, let's say, versus the way it's uh, discussed inside the world of photography. I'd be most familiar with, let's say, Marshall's work and how collage has a huge tradition inside of architecture that might be different from collage inside the tradition of photography. But all three of you would have similar versions to that, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, I'll be perfectly honest. The conversations I have about the, the collages um, in the world outside of architecture are far more interesting than the ones I have inside because in a way, inside architecture, in, inside our own field, our own kind of professional borders, it's seen as a kind of ancillary practice, whereas to everyone else, like, that is the thing, right? <laughs> like, that is the, that is the thing um, that they find really compelling often, or other kinds of things that I'm doing, like work experience with video. Uh, for So it's, it's become, it's very freeing. And what I found is that it's incredibly productive. So for example, the way that the Chimera, they kind of took me a place outside of conventional architectural practice, but then when that kind of work came back in, it energized the work in the, the let's say, the, the architectural proposals, um, things that were more clearly defined as architectural proposals, it energized them in a whole new, whole new way. It's like this old cliche that innovation never comes from the inside, right? And so I think that's, for me, it's true in that, 
in that case. If you don't mind me changing the question a little bit, I mean, the thing that we, we talked about a little bit ahead of time uh, was this idea of um, how does including this work in the biennial uh, affect the kind of uh, conversation around it. And I think that, you know, if I am speak about this work in sociology, I speak about it in this sort of more kind of like a public sociology or public photography kind of realm that I find that a lot of the conversations, a lot of the questions are kind of the same. Um, but when I bring it, uh, or when the, the work is brought into a place like this, that uh, that there's this uh, new attention on the, the form, I think in a way that uh, that doesn't exist otherwise. And it's interesting to see how that that aspect of the work becomes uh, sort of uh, emphasized and then folded into existing narratives about, um, you know, for one, one example would be that when I present this work uh, to an architecture audience, uh, usually someone brings up Pruitt Igo at some point mm -hmm. and talks about, you know, this sort of old debate with an architecture about, you know, is, uh, was it the building's fault that Pruitt Igo in, in uh, St. Louis failed, right? And of course, the argument is usually no, uh, but, you know, so this is an argument that is usually brought up when I present an uh, uh, you know, an architecture audience, it's not something that usually happens uh, if it's a photographic audience or something that's a sociological audience. And so I think as someone who's sort of sitting at a number of different uh, uh, sort of intersections of fields, it's just fascinating to see how, um, how the field frames the work consistently um, and how an opportunity like this is really nice because it gives us the, the, the sort of a, a opportunity to maybe open that frame up a little bit or apply these different frames in different ways. I think there is no such thing like a photographical audience um, <laughs> because it is a very sort of like, you can see this is a medium everyone uses daily up to, I don't know, 100 times it became through the telephones where we all have inbuilt cameras. And um, there are so many different uses um, of photography. Like for me, the most pictures I take is this type of notebook um, photography from the computer. Okay, I need to find the CCA or I need to find Marshall Studio. So I take a screenshot from what Google tells me how to get there. So half of my photographs are like pictures from Google because I have no internet in in uh, Chicago, so it becomes a tool and, and um, I would never, it, it, I start to find it interesting what I find in my phone because I'm never taking the pictures I would take otherwise. It's really like um, useful things. I see a TV screen and then I take a picture of the price and uh, like these type of things. And I think there is, um, I, I mean, I'm pretty sort of like, um, um, I, I know much about photography, um, in terms of that my, my, my really my first formation was uh, photography and I, I, I tried to, to get rid of this sort of like that the photograph always tells you here this is what you see this was there and it's gone like it's in the past so this kind of what Roland Bard talks about the, the referent is always like really uh, it's, a, it's bound to the image and, and um, that's why a lot of young artists want to make abstract photography because you, you, you try to get rid of the referent, you know? And I think what is interesting in, in our constellation is that like in terms of time, like you're, you're talking about the past. I mean, whenever we take a picture, it, what we have photographed is already part of the past and part of this idea of death as well. Like, but you're sort of like depicting as a specific moment in life that belongs to the past afterwards. I try to kind of like generate a, a specific presence in the present and, and, um, and you sort of like prospect uh, a future by using used outdated materials. So I think the, the aim is, is going in, in terms of, of the time we, we try to um, thematized maybe is going in really the, the three possible directions if you think of linear linearity in time. So this is really interesting. It's not so much, oh, this is documentary photography and this is collage, like these kind of like um, styles or mediums or uses, but it's more the work is, is um, really prospecting in complete different um, times. Yeah, I think the time you know, and this loops back to the, what preceded the question, I was thinking that, um, or one of the things that I realized that in my practice, time itself has become somewhat of a medium. 
And I think that happened partially because of the projects in Brooklyn. The big takeaway from that project for me was that my project, although it's trying to project a future, it was too late. It was too late. And so I realized that I had to change the way that I really thought as an architect, that I had to become a kind of time traveler, that I had to always put my mind, you know, 30, 50, 100 years into the future, looking back. And then that created all these weird situations where, yes, I'm projecting a future, but for me, it's the past. <laughs> so I call them future histories, right? So it's this. So even in the exhibitions, I'm imagining the drawings and things um, as archival in a way, as though I'm not there. I'm like a ghost walking around the room, and you know, these are things that were dug up. Uh, from my studio and little fragments and they have dates on them and they're stamped and mm -hmm. so I think yes that that kind of way in which um, the photographic medium whether it's uh, the way either of you are working in a kind of documentary way or in other ways or whether it's collage somehow allows us to play with time or dance across time or for for me that that kind of magic has been a, maybe one of the most productive things. Mm -hmm. well, um, we could keep on going, but, um, but I believe we are out of time. Um, <laughs> uh, if there's no other pressing questions from the audience, um, I would like to thank everybody on the stage, very much so. Um, all of you, and uh, especially the um, Architecture Biennial and the Terra Foundation for um, helping to make this evening possible. Thank you all very much for joining us.